So now let's talk about anemia in CKD. So uh, typically in chronic kidney disease, um, a patient develops a normocytic, normochromic, and hypoproliferative uh, type of anemia. Okay, now we're looking at the kidney and this hormone uh, called erythropoietin. So uh, the kidney is the main source of this hormone. Uh, we're going to call it EPO for short. And so the kidney secretes uh, EPO. And so specifically, um, this is a glycoprotein that's uh, secreted by interstitial fibroblasts. So these are cells in the interstitium and they're uh, surrounding peritubular capillaries and the proximal convoluted tubules. So in response to um, hypoxemia or a low uh, hemoglobin concentration, um, erythropoietin is secreted by these cells in the kidney. Erythropoietin goes to the bone marrow, and in the bone marrow, it stimulates erythropoiesis, so the production of new red blood cells. So um, this is one of our um, homeostatic mechanisms to keep the hemoglobin concentration or the hematocrit within normal range in response to any kind of stress. And so the kidney is a key regulator of the hematocrit through this mechanism. Okay, so why does a patient with chronic kidney disease have anemia? So um, for one mechanism, you could imagine that if uh, these interstitial cells that are making erythropoietin are replaced by a scar, so if a patient develops uh, renal fibrosis, interstitial fibrosis, they're losing a good healthy kidney mass, they're losing those cells that are making erythropoietin, you know, they're making less erythropoietin than they already would be in the setting of anemia. And so um, we don't typically measure erythropoietin levels in patients with kidney disease. Um, in fact, the serum erythropoietin concentrations may be normal or actually increased in the setting of anemia, but compared to a similarly anemic patient who doesn't have CKD, um, their erythropoietin concentration is typically 10 to 100 times less than the patient without CKD. So we like to think that the erythropoietin concentrations and uh, secretion is inappropriately low given the level of anemia. Um, so, so basically just think about it as um, losing functional ability to secrete appropriate concentrations of EPO to uh, correct the anemia that is seen. So there are a number of other reasons why uh, patients with CKD develop anemia. Uh, one of them has to do with retention of uremic solutes. So the uremic milieu um, can actually inhibit erythropoiesis at the level of the bone marrow. Also, uh, uremia appears to cause decreased red blood cell survival. Also, um, there's this uh, hormone protein called hepcidin. So hepcidin is a key regulator of iron metabolism. So Remember that we um, have storage iron, so iron is available in macrophages and the reticuloendothelial system. So uh, this storage iron can be mobilized um, in settings of, you know, for becoming iron deficient, we can mobilize the iron, uh, move it to the bone marrow, and make more red blood cells. Also, in our diet, so dietary iron is absorbed, right? So here we are absorbing iron. Um, this can be absorbed. Um, Obviously, we need iron as an essential cofactor uh, and to produce more hemoglobin. So, hepcidin as a key regulator is increased. So, it's uh, increased in the setting of inflammation. And remember, chronic inflammation is one uh, component of chronic kidney disease. So, when hepcidin concentrations are very high, it will actually inhibit the movement of storage iron into the circulation and it inhibits dietary iron absorption. So it inhibits our ability to uh, extract iron from uh, our diet. It inhibits our ability to use iron from our iron stores. And so um, this is the, you know, the key reason why um, you know, patients develop an anemia of chronic inflammation and um, also why uh, patients develop anemia of chronic kidney disease. Not only these other things are happening, but also it's a functional iron deficiency. We may have enough iron in our diet. We may have enough iron in storage. We just can't move that iron to where it needs to be, which is in the bone marrow. Okay, now let's think about our approach to anemia and chronic kidney disease based on what we um, already learned. So these represent some of the labs that um, should be ordered, at least when you're starting uh, your workup on a patient with uh, chronic kidney disease and anemia. So Number one, I think every patient deserves a complete blood count. So the CBC 
In addition to giving you the hemoglobin and hematocrit, which makes the diagnosis of anemia, you also want to look at the platelets and the white blood cell count. For example, what if all the cell lines are down? Well, then that tells you that there's a primary bone marrow problem. Um, and so uh, this may not be just simple anemia of chronic kidney disease. It may be due to um, some other process occurring in the bone marrow. So next, I check the absolute reticulocyte count. So remember, reticulocytes are immature uh, red blood cells that have just uh, freshly exited the bone marrow. And so uh, when you measure reticulocytes, you're uh, measuring um, the efficacy of erythropoiesis, essentially. So um, using the absolute reticulocyte count and the current um, hematocrit, you can calculate the reticulocyte production index. And so um, this helps you determine whether it is a hypoproliferative anemia or a hyperproliferative anemia. So in the setting of um, like an acute uh, bleeding event or hemolysis, um, you know, the patient could have a hyperproliferative anemia. In that sense, the, the bone marrow is working hard to keep up with the anemia by producing many more red blood cells. But in the setting of anemia with CKD, as we just showed in the, the prior sort of uh, concepts, uh, it's actually hypoproliferative due to the relative erythropoietin uh, deficiency um, sort of blocks on the bone marrow from uremia and then also um, essentially inadequate iron delivery to the bone marrow uh, due to hepcidin. So um, it should be a hypoproliferative anemia for CKD. So next we measure the, the so-called ingredients that are required to make red blood cells. So for one, we measure the serum ferritin because this is a measure of uh, iron stores. And so if this is uh, very, very low, that tells us the patient is iron deficient. We also measure the serum iron as well as the total iron binding capacity. And so we use these two numbers together to calculate the TSAT or the transferrin saturation. So this is the uh, serum iron divided by the total iron binding capacity times 100, and that gives us the TSAT. And so as we're going to see in a little bit, we use the serum ferritin as well as the TSAT to help us determine whether um, our patient with CKD has a functional um, iron deficiency. In addition, uh, you know, just to be uh, diligent, it's worth checking at least uh, folate and B12 to make sure that some of these other cofactors for uh, red blood cell production are adequate. And so if they're inadequate, you could, you know, replete these uh, just to make sure erythropoiesis doesn't have any other uh, blocks or problems that would impede your ability to, to fix the anemia. So uh, using the labs that you've obtained, you know, the patient would have anemia if the hemoglobin is less than 13 uh, gram per deciliter in men and less than 12 grams per deciliter in women. So uh, once you've made the diagnosis and let's say you've proven that it's hypoproliferative and um, the patient has CKD, uh, now it's time to think about how to approach treatment. And so in general, um, you know, anemia and CKD has been associated with uh, poor outcomes, reduced quality of life, increased its in incidence of uh, cardiovascular disease and higher rates of hospital admissions. So, you know, we do want to uh, correct anemia. Uh, we do want to avoid uh, patients requiring blood transfusions. And so we do have a couple of tools up our sleeve uh, to correct anemia. So our two tools include iron therapy, so either oral iron or IV iron, and ESA therapy. So this stands for erythropoiesis stimulating agents. And so this is a collective term for um, recombinant proteins, so recombinant erythropoietin and other synthetic derivatives that basically um, replace erythropoietin. If the kidney is not making enough or it's uh, inappropriately low, we can supplement that by uh, providing these erythropoiesis stimulating agents that mimic uh, the action of erythropoietin. So in terms of who needs iron therapy, uh, one thing you have to do uh, when managing CKD patients is, um, especially regarding the ferritin, so you pretty much have to ignore the normal range of ferritin that your lab will provide. Because um, remember the concepts we just discussed is that you know patients, even though their, their ferritin may be normal or increased, they could still have a functional iron deficiency. And so essentially that means we have a higher threshold um, for the ferritins and the transferrin saturations we're willing to treat at. So, and, um, you know, this is opinion-based, but um, in some patients with CKD who actually are not anemic, if they have low ferritin, so if their ferritin is less than 100 nanograms per milliliter, 
and the transferrin saturation is less than 20%, these patients could um, you know, receive iron in order to help uh, build up iron stores. In addition, a patient with CKD and anemia, um, if the ferritin is less than 500 nanograms per ml or the transferrin saturation is less than 30%, you know, this patient could benefit from receiving iron therapy. So now you can identify which patients uh, you know, need iron therapy. And so we do have a couple of options, so oral iron or IV iron. And so before you, you know, prescribe any therapy, um, but especially with iron therapy, I want you to at least think about um, you know, what are the uh, potential benefits of uh, giving iron versus the potential risks. And so you know, the benefits in a patient with CKD, um, you know, keep in mind what's the severity of the anemia first. Also, keep in mind, you know, is this going to help prevent or avoid or minimize blood transfusions? Will this help prevent or avoid having to use expensive, you know, uh, EPO therapy? Um, or are there any other anemia-related symptoms? And then um, remember, for each therapy here, we do have, um, you know, some side effects and risks. So uh, oral iron, you know, can cause constipation or GI uh, side effects. IV iron, it's uh, you know very effective but more expensive, um, so the cost is higher. Requires IV access that's reliable, and then um, you know some of the iron preparations, especially iron dextrin, has uh, an anaphylactoid reaction uh, that's quite high. So we there are some side effects. Um, we tend to not use iron dextrin anymore. There are other newer um, agents that uh, are used for IV iron. Uh, but still, there are some side effects um, that are used. But before prescribing it, just consider, you know, whether it's really worth, you know, accepting this small but uh, appreciable risk. So a lot of these recommendations are opinion-based and obviously should be individualized to each patient. But um, you know, I, th I think for a lot of stable CKD patients with uh, anemia who meet uh, these guidelines right here, you know, it's not unreasonable to start with oral iron. And so, you know, a typical starting dose would be um, ferrosulfate at like 325 milligrams three times a day, or maybe you could even do twice a day to make sure they tolerate it fine before increasing it. So it's not unreasonable to try oral iron for one to three months and then see if it improves the hemoglobin or improves iron stores um, before jumping to something like IV iron, just because the cost is higher and the side effect profile um, is higher with IV iron. So not unreasonable to try oral iron. It may be ineffective, remember, because gut absorption of iron may be impaired due to hepcidin. So um, try oral iron first. It's cheaper. It may be effective. But if it's ineffective, and let's say the patient's developing you know, worsening anemia, you're worried about side effects of anemia, um, then it's worthwhile to consider IV iron. So if oral iron's failing, or if there's some other contraindication to oral iron, then IV iron can be very effective. But keep in mind, you know, the cost is higher, the patient will need good IV access. And then uh, the side effects, as mentioned, um, as with each uh, IV iron preparation. Also, uh, many bacteria depend on iron for their growth, and so uh, there are some association studies and in vitro data suggesting that um, you know IV iron or iron therapy can actually accelerate uh, bacterial um, growth and uh, worsen infections. So, sort of as a um, a non graded recommendation from KDGO guidelines, uh, they recommend not administering IV iron during an active systemic. Okay, so now what about ESA therapy? So this includes some medications like epotin alpha, uh, darbopoetin alpha. So these are agents that are going to um, essentially replace uh, the insufficient erythropoietin. So um, certainly you wouldn't start with ESA therapy unless you've first corrected any uh, functional iron deficiency. So in my mind, I, I think about you know correcting the iron stores and then moving on to thinking about using ESA therapy or not. And so for patients with CKD, you know, these are some of the uh, recommendations on the KDGO guidelines. You know, if the hemoglobin's at 10 or above, so 10 grams per deciliter, you know, that patient doesn't uh, really need um, ESA therapy. You know, if the hemoglobin is less than 10, you know, this is when you should start considering ESA therapy. And so anytime you're considering it, you know, just think about the risks versus the benefits. And so the main benefits would be um, avoiding or minimizing the need for blood transfusion. Um, you know, maybe if a patient has symptomatic anemia, obviously correcting the hemoglobin could improve those symptoms. But um, in general, we do not want the hemoglobin to be corrected uh, above 11.5, especially 
uh, we don't want it to get as high as 13 grams per deciliter. So um, when ESA therapy has been used in the past and in trials, so to speak, to get the hemoglobin uh, back to, quote, you know, normal population levels, um, it was associated with some um, serious risks like uh, risk for stroke, worsening hypertension, and if a, if a patient happened to have a vascular access, uh, there was access thrombosis. So um, you don't want to normalize the hemoglobin. We just want to keep it high enough to keep the patient symptom-free and keep the patient free from blood transfusions, which carries this other risk for um, alloimmunization, uh, for instance, if they're interested in getting a kidney transplant in the future. So we mainly use ESA therapy to keep the hemoglobin um, high enough so they have no symptoms and need no transfusions. On that same note, uh, ESA therapy should be used in, with great caution in patients with a history of stroke and also a history of malignancy. Um, apparently, uh, erythropoietin has some uh, anti-apoptotic effects and can have some uh, benefits for malignant cells. And so for a patient with active malignancy or history of malignancy, um, you should just at least consider ESA therapy, whether it's uh, really indicated or not, and uh, discuss these risks with the patient. So um, there are a couple situations where you really should uh, consider when to use it. And, you know, let's assume that we started uh, ESA therapy on a patient. Um, during the initiation phase, when you're starting therapy, it's uh, worthwhile to check the hemoglobin every month um, just to make sure it's a uh, number one is the response and uh, number two that's not uh, increasing uh, too rapidly because remember once we said it gets above 11.5 you'd want to stop therapy then once you're um, in sort of a stable maintenance phase it's a uh, um, prudent to check a hemoglobin and a ferritin and the transferrin saturation every three months because remember um, if at any point the patient uh, sort of develops a functional iron deficiency then it'd be uh, worthwhile to revisit the iron uh, therapy piece because um, if you're stimulating the bone marrow, you want to produce more red blood cells, you have to make sure you have all the ingredients. And so um, iron is one of those key ingredients. And so um, this is one approach uh, to the patient with anemia and CKD. One therapy uh, missing from here um, that you can obviously use is a transfusion of red blood cells, but we do try to minimize the need for transfusion, mainly due to that risk of allosensitization and also uh, red blood cell transfusion has other side effects associated with it and um, you know, requires a little more resources. And um, so using iron and ESA therapy can minimize the need for blood transfusions and minimize the risks associated with that. Uh, but sometimes you may have to use that, especially if someone's uh, you know, severely anemic or having um, acute uh, you know, blood loss. But um, you know, this is a general approach and um, supported by current guidelines.